dialogue, design, animation, and annotation. NPCs fill the worlds of our favorite video games in a multitude of ways. I happen to like people watching in games, and I also like virtual photography, aka the use of in-game photo modes and camera tools to frame and compose interesting shots. So at the intersection of those two things, I've been photographing NPCs as my subjects of interest for some time now. I talk to them when I can, follow them around, and I imagine what their lives might be like. I pay extra attention to their clothing, character design, behavior patterns that I think might go unnoticed by the average player. And here's what I learned. In... The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a delight. For about a thousand and one reasons super glued to one another, all working in tandem to create a lively and lived-in Hyrule. You don't need me to tell you that. Its predecessor, Breath of the Wild, largely did the same. What makes Tears' NPCs so special are that, one, Hyrule has developed in a big way and become much more filled out and interconnected, and two, a large number of the NPCs involved are returning figures from Breath of the Wild, and their storylines and dialogue are expanded on with that continuity in mind, building on what was previously established about each of them. This holds true for even the ones with small roles. Quick forward, there are no spoilers here for the main story, but this video does necessitate side quest and world spoilers across both games. Make of that what you will. Let's kick off with an example. The previous game featured these two bickering old men, Olkin and Steen of Kakariko Village. One grew pumpkins, the other grew carrots. They were rivals. Sometimes you could even catch Olkin sneaking into Steen's garden in the middle of the night to stomp all over his carrots. As the town's resident expert on fortified pumpkins, Olkin knew the value of a good defense, and would go on runs at night to build up his endurance only stopping to complain about Steen's recklessness if you talk to him. Steen cultivated carrots, and of course, valued and practiced offense, and their rivalry was largely relegated to being a fun thing you could notice in the background. In Tears of the Kingdom though, you're asked to reconcile a spat between them as part of a side quest. When you approach the duo, you see them arguing over offense versus defense again, and if you pan around behind, you can see Steen just carries a blade for offense while Olkin just carries a shield for defense. It's a fun way of leaning into the absurdity of their rivalry. Banning the camera down, you can also see how the animators have kept their fists shaking while they yell at each other. I noticed a similar animation on just about any character who's huffin' and puffin'. Talk to a riled up Goron in either game and it'll be especially apparent. It's a pretty fun effect to see up close, while at the usual distance you still register the intended a uh, tension from it, without really thinking about it. By showing off the value of a balanced fighting style, Link helps resolve Olkin and Steen's long-standing dispute. And afterwards, you can walk in and find them mumbling in their sleep about how good friends they are now. Olkin also fulfills a lifelong dream of having his pumpkin stocked in the local shop, which is run by Steen's wife. He'd mentioned being upset about Steen not allowing him to back in Breath of the Wild. Here we see a full character arc for these two men play out over the course of two games, beginning with silly rivalry and ending with friendship. We don't see either of them sabotaging the other's garden anymore at night either. Instead, you can catch them helping tend to each other's crops in the wee hours of the morning. And if you follow them, you can see them go from tending one crop to the other together. Like clockwork. Like in the last game, NPCs have specific routines for each day cycle. These daily routines are shaped around whatever niche hobbies or rituals each is into. Take one of the other villagers, Kato. In the previous game, he and his wife Rola were separated on account of their conflicting interests. For the majority of Tears of the Kingdom, he's traveling the world and no longer in Kakariko Village, but it is possible to get him to return later on. When you do so, he finds that his house has been taken over, and even his beloved pets have abandoned him. 
Follow him around for a while and you'll find that part of his new routine includes standing outside his wife's shop and rehearsing how to ask her for forgiveness. Ultimately though, he chickens out every time. Kako's out? Whatever. If you go inside, you'll find Rola has picked up on more than she lets on. Or take Dorian's family unit, which had an even richer backstory in the last game. Dorian was a widower and a father of two. You could learn about how he lost his wife to the evil Yiga clan by taking on his side quest. And I won't recap all of it, but the man is basically a tragic figure ripped straight out of his own samurai film. In Tears of the Kingdom, you can find him and his daughter starting every morning off with a prayer for his late wife by these statues. Afterwards, he and the older daughter Coco go off to work, while the youngest, Kotla, runs off to play. You can find Kotla drawing pictures in the dirt, every day when possible. Sometimes it's pictures of herself with her mom. She can't totally remember what she looked like. But she tries. Neither of the kids know the details behind how their mom passed, but they do at least know she's gone now, after Dorian tried to keep her fate a secret from them back in Breath of the Wild. You can acquire a Yiga clan disguise later into Tears of the Kingdom and try to talk to Dorian in it, keeping his history from Breath of the Wild in mind. He isn't amused. Quite a few of the major characters have comments about this outfit. Baya, Bora, and especially Jasha have really animated reactions to it, but Dorian's feels like a particularly nice touch because he's otherwise such a tertiary figure. His is just one example out of many. Olkin and Steen will warn you to take it off, lest you offend someone. Like Dorian. On the flip side, Townspeople will wish you well if you buy one of their local garlands and attach it to your equipment. As with the last game, there are a ridiculous number of cases in which NPCs will react to the clothes you choose to put on. Or don't? Mm. Nowadays, they'll notice weapons and attachments too. Sometimes they comment on it in passing in little speech bubbles. While at other times, they're excited to talk to you about it. NPC routines can vary based on the weather, but what's truly impressive is that their dialogue for scripted events can vary based on weather and time of day too. They might mention how the sun or the clouds are making it hard to see a landmark right now. Or it's too dark to see a nearby cave they want you to check out or that you're working hard in the rain. I cannot even begin to fathom how much programming this took on the part of the developers. As with the comments about your clothes, this helps make your interactions feel unique and personalized. Again, Breath of the Wild did these things too, but it's taken to another level here. And any knowledge you can recall about returning NPCs has some potential to add even more dimension to how they react to you. There isn't much information online about the specifics of who programmed what, but here's an overview of the names credited for NPC programming. Props to them. Even the more episodic side quests maintain continuity from Breath of the Wild in subtle ways. Take Kiana from the small seaside fishing town of Lurelin Village. In the last game, she was a stay-at-home mom in a family of four, living with her fisherman husband and two sons. She was defined, and defined herself, purely by her love of laundry and cooking. She had the signature dish her family loved, a seafood paella that they ask you to get ingredients for. In Tears of the Kingdom, you learn that she's putting her culinary skills to use professionally now. She's opened a restaurant called Azure Bay in the time between. Good for her, right? She even has that seafood paella on her menu, and will serve one to Link on the house. 
As a whole, the Luralin villagers shirts, shorts, seashell necklaces and hand-carved jewelry and open vests all lend themselves to a scrappy but self-sufficient vibe. Their costumes and props feel handcrafted and befitting of a small fishing town aesthetic. As stated in the art book Creating a Champion, the Luralin villagers were designed with warm tropical weather in mind. It's why most of them wear short sleeves. I especially love the pieces of cloth some of the fishermen keep tied around their arms, sure to have a lot of uses while out boating in the heat. It's a cultural thing that crosses borders too. Tauro, a more important character who you meet in Kakariko, but who is originally from Luralin, wears one on his arm too. I want to shout out his design because he wears some particularly cool accessories worth highlighting. My favorite is what I initially assumed to be an amulet he kept around his neck, which, later on, I noticed was a portable magnifying glass. It's pretty resourceful. With all of that being said, you don't need to have played the first game to appreciate these NPCs. Most of the quests are totally self-contained, and these references I've been mentioning are bonus features at best. Your potential for hijinks, therefore, is largely self-contained as well. <laughs> You'll notice an abundance of storytelling work that takes place within the confines of Tears of the Kingdom, with NPCs going through full arcs in the background. Lurilin's distinctive look dates back to Breath of the Wild first, of course, but at the time, these villagers were more isolated from the rest of Hyrule than other Hylian towns. For reasons I won't spoil, this has changed a bit in our latest entry. Nowadays, you're able to find them traveling, camping, or set up in other towns. In fact, if you happen to meet Kiana and her family before they return to Luralin, they'll recognize you and talk about how you made an impression on them while they were out camping. Again, infusing a personal touch to the order in which you've been interacting with the world. One side quest sees Kiana's kids looking for their father's old favorite shirt to surprise him. It's worth noting he didn't dress any differently seven years ago, so this is presumably a shirt we haven't seen before. After finding it, you can put it on yourself before you hand it back. And all of the family members will express varying degrees of confusion upon seeing you. The dad himself, Sebasto, usually keeps his eyes glued to the newspaper, so he won't notice the shirt when you bug him. But I waited around until he got up for bed just to see if he'd notice then. He does! It's a more isolated questline, but I got a good chuckle out of it all. The cool thing is, the shirt is a reference to Link's first outfit in Wind Waker, which is fitting given Lorelin's resemblance to Outset Island. But you don't need any of that context to appreciate the vignette that's playing out here. If you check out their laundry situation, you can also see low-polygon copies of Sebasto's current shirt hung up on the clotheslines in both games. Maybe my favorite photo op around Luralin, though, involves a budding romance between two Rito, one of whom comes on a retreat here after you've helped him finish up his quest lines. Here's the scene. Again, this is a substory that takes place entirely within the confines of Tears, and it's a pretty cute one. Luralin also features the fisherman Arms, who invited you to freely help yourself to his catch because he cooked more than he needed in Breath of the Wild. He is as altruistic as ever in Tears of the Kingdom, as he offers you to take absolutely anything you want that he finds while out fishing. All in all, we see a lot of characters and even their personalities and purposes being recycled. I don't see it purely as reuse though, but more so as refinement. These characters are all archetypes, but they get to grow within those archetypes. Some of them develop. In some cases, their fashion sense changes with the times. Their interests do, too. There once was a single-minded quest giver named Manny of Hateno Village. He was infatuated with the local innkeeper, Prima, and asked Link to scope out her interests for him. It didn't go well. 
In a bit of a running joke, the quest he assigns you in Tears of the Kingdom plays out almost the exact same way as his and Prima's in Breath of the Wild, but the target of Manny's affections has shifted. Nowadays, he's obsessed with the general store's creator, Ivy. It makes sense he's had to move on though, because Prima is happily married to someone else now. Check her out, first in Breath of the Wild, and here with her husband in Tears of the Kingdom. For a good measure, here's a before and after of Ivy too. And here's one of Manny. Now, if you haven't played the game, I promise there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for the mushroom hats. I mean, they don't look good. There's a decked out donkey in Hateno Village, and it looks less asinine than the rest of the population, but they are part of how Tears continues to mix things up, even as it recycles a few past character models. The absurdity is the joke, the fact that the game plays it straight makes it that much funnier. Hateno Village has gone through a major change with the arrival of Sisi, a fashion designer whose trends have taken the town by storm. NPCs here, especially the younger ones, tend to be sporting her strange brand of mushroom-themed clothes, and they'll be extremely impressed with you for dressing… uh, haute couture as well. A big part of how I pick NPCs to snapshot is what I see them wearing or carrying, and Hateno is a hotbed of different fashion styles, urban developments, and agricultural innovations. As a result, it's quite rewarding to explore through a camera lens. In creating a champion, the artists draw a key distinction between the costumes here and in Lurelin. Most of the villagers here wear long sleeves, because Hateno is further north, nearer to the cold mountains. However ridiculous Cece's new line looks, it does keep in line with that. Due credit, I'm also a fan of her handbag, earring, and lantern designs, which are mostly carried by tourists. Check them out! But my favorite update? It has to do with the kids. It makes sense to reuse character models for the adults, or to just dress them a little differently, but many of the kids around Hyrule have visibly grown up into tweens with new looks. Here's Dorian's daughter, Coco, for instance, who dreamed of becoming a chef like her mom last we saw her. She's doing something else now though, selling the Kakariko garlands which she came up with herself. While her younger sister hasn't aged visibly in the same way, you'll find she has matured as a character. Follow her after her playtime and you can find her practicing cooking now in a secret cave. Oh, sorry referencing their late mother's recipes in the same way Coco used to. They're even the same recipes Coco learned from. Here's a before and after of them by their pot, as Kotla takes over her mom and later elder sister's passion. The difference is she wants to surprise her dad and sister, and so she experiments in secret. Here are Kiana's kids, who she would watch after as they fell asleep in Breath of the Wild. And now, we see the older one has gotten bigger. Well, it's their dad's turn to tuck them in for bedtime these days. Here's a look at some of the kids from Hateno, during, and after Breath of the Wild. I'm especially proud of Sephiro, who was a mean brat last time, and has grown into kind of a nerd who stays behind to spend some extra time reading in school. He's just as abrasive if you catch him doing it though. So, the school is important for a few reasons that I'll cycle back to, especially at the end of the video, but it is just one of the many new developments that have been built around Hateno. Watching the kids run there every morning, excited to learn and play together is a joy, but the thing that does it for me is the townspeople's admiration for Zelda. See, she's the one who led a majority of the development efforts all around town, including the construction of the school. One of the students, Karin, is obsessed with her. She watches over Zelda's house every day after school, hoping she'll return. Through your camera, you can see four drawings in the classroom, each presumably drawn by one of the students, and it's pretty clear that Karin's must be the one of herself and her friend with her idol. It's a lovely detail. The other pictures include one of Zelda's favorite flower, the Silent Princess as well. 
Upstairs in the teacher's office, you can also spot one more drawing, this time of one of the students with the teacher. As a final note on Hateno, here's a quote from former lead structural artist, and now senior landscape lead artist, Manabu Takehara, stating that it was designed as the baseline village concept for Breath of the Wild. It's perhaps the most populated of the towns, but with the expanded trade and globalization around Hyrule, Tears of the Kingdom sees a lot of its influence reach outwards to other parts of the world. But it's influenced by those parts as well, in return. Again, Zelda has been a key figure behind this boom in interconnectivity. We'll revisit this point about her at the end. We've largely covered the Hylians up to this point, so before we move on to the other Hyrulean races, I'll reiterate Nintendo me expert Alice, or at Hey I'm Heroic on Twitter's findings about Breath of the Wild. In January of 2021, they discovered that Hylian NPCs are modeled using an advanced version of the me format. Alice has since confirmed that the same remains true for Tears. In an excerpt from Creating a Champion, former NPC artist and now senior lead character artist Manabu Hiraoka called the Mii Maker a special tool they used to fine-tune the faces almost constantly throughout production. Hiraoka also writes that their personal favorite NPC was Brenly the Birdman, who is just such a strange choice. I would never have guessed. His hair is pretty funny to watch in the wind, I guess? Anyway, Branley returns in Tears of the Kingdom with an actual Rito assistant helping him with his flight studies, so props to him for moving up in the world. I'm less psyched for said assistant Mimo, who was once a mysterious meditating mentor figure all the way out on Eventide Island, and is now collabing with... Branley the Birdman? <laughs> sure. It's a truly impressive feat that every Hylian NPC is named and has a unique personality. This also means that most of these faces are fixed and unique as well, with one exception. You might notice that the Yiga clan members who disguise themselves as friends don't have names, nor are their faces fixed. I snapshotted, saved, reloaded, and snapped the same ones a few times, and found that their faces are randomized. Here's a look. And from what I can tell, it is a finite pool of faces, so they're not infinitely variable. In fact, the pool seems to be made up of other existing NPCs, as seen here. While hanging out with them in Disguise Yourself, you can also drop bananas on the ground to trigger some funny reactions. When it comes to the other races, such as the Zora, Rito, Gerudo, and Gorons, there's less variability in their models. That said, you can still distinguish individual characters, humanoid and otherwise, through the props they carry, or through their animations. One of the nicest things about your camera is that it detects items tied to your compendium, even if they're being carried by other characters. And the developers use this to great effect as it infuses a bit more extra personality into each NPC. You can see what kinds of weapons and shields they favor, and what enhancements or monster parts they attach to them to customize them. It's an inventive way of keeping things fresh, even as you pass by familiar models. It signals their professions and interests to... Travelers and insect enthusiasts carry hunter's shields, which are emblazoned with images of rabbits said to bring luck. Fishermen carry shields with fish on them meant to inspire an auspicious catch, etc. But what I want to highlight are the accoutrements and flavor text the camera doesn't detect. For instance, some of the construction workers who are spelunking around the world and fixing things up seem to be carrying grappling hooks, or hook shots if you prefer, in their utility belts, a staple established by Bolson's company back in Breath of the Wild. A treasure hunting Gerudo carries a particularly stuffed bag of equipment beneath her shiny gold shields and weapons. All travelers carry lamps for light as well, and the designs of the lamp differ based on the region the NPC hails from. Journalists scrawl over their notebooks with these fancy pens. Not only do the monster control crew carry makeshift weapons, but they'll also wear buckets on their heads like improvised helmets. Lastly, the fashion designer, who usually wears a sun hat, 
will lose the hat when she runs to the shade to shelter from the rain. Hats off to the programmers for that one. Picango the painter has a backpack stuffed with art supplies. Not just the paintbrushes and easels you see him whip out, but also spare scrolls, a container to hold his paint, and a ruler for precision. Watch his shoes when he walks too. His feet and sandals are animated as separate objects, so that his feet lift before his sandals do, which is just peak attention to detail. The next time someone says Nintendo doesn't care about graphics, I will urge them to look at Picango's feet. Not a lot of people in Hyrule wear glasses, but among those who do, there are different styles across the different regions. Note, also, that the children's drawings can have different styles too. The students in Hateno draw rounded faces and only color in the essential details, while Hudson and Ronson's daughter draws blockier, more filled out landscapes. Lastly, Cece's clothing line isn't the only reason returning NPCs have changed their clothes since last time. Take Tracy and her sisters, whose journalism business has taken off around Hyrule with the recent newspaper boom. They're busier and doing more fieldwork now as a result, and you can see one of them, Joanelle, has put on a heavy winter jacket here to navigate the recent blizzards in her area. Tracy's in a winter jacket now too. That said, the third sister, Doma, is in a relatively warm part of the map, so her outfit hasn't changed as much. Except for one small detail. She's matched her colleagues with a patterned Lucky Clover Gazette sash on her arm to rep their new brand. We also have new uniforms in the form of the Zonai Research Team Fests, where some of the members are returning characters who've joined and suited up, and again, their backpacks contain more props such as marked maps and pickaxes. Even in the cases of those who haven't changed, I couldn't help but re-admire the original details in the stable worker uniforms, which have these cool animal patterns on them, and literal horseshoes as their belt clasps. It's very on brand. Similarly, the Gerudo who rent out sand seals wear these sand seal patterned getups, and this rock star sand seal racer does the same, with cool sunglasses to boot. With a lot of these designs, the artists created a stylish enough foundation with Breath of the Wild that they are rightly still embracing. To go back to talking animations, check out the battle squads before a fight breaks out and you can see them warming up in various ways. In the case of the warriors Zora and Gerudo, watch them while they're training, and you'll notice a decent amount of variation in how they coordinate their attacks and strike with their spears. Where they aren't distinguished by props, costumes, and animation, NPCs stand out through… what else but dialogue. You can knock Nintendo's storytelling all you want, but there's legitimately funny and interesting writing here, specific to each character's voice. Why does this one Zora call you Linny in a throwaway line? Why does she sound a bit more familiar and even flirtatious at times? Well, ask her in Breath of the Wild. There's a whole story behind her and Link's friendship that Tears wastes no time repeating. Why does little Tebow, seen here in 2017 and now today, use the word suspicious so much, despite clearly not knowing what it means? Well, it's because he's taken on some additional responsibilities while his father's out of town, watching over the perimeter like his dad once did. And it's the same word his dad used to use in Breath of the Wild. There were these two Hylians on a miserable honeymoon in Breath of the Wild, and they're no longer married in this one. The ex-wife has founded her own business, while the ex-husband has gotten remarried to someone else. But it seems he's got a type. His new partner's still the outspoken one in the equation. For some self-contained examples, look to Tauro, who uses a lot of fishing metaphors because he's originally from Lurlin. Even the game pats itself on the back for that one. On your first visit to the Zora Kingdom, you can find the kids doing impressions of the king that go like this. And as you can see here, they're pretty good. In Tarrytown, you'll also see a Hylian child who uses Gerudo phrases because her best friend was a Gerudo. On a related note, one of the changes we see nationwide is the proliferation of Gerudo slang, popularized by the youth. 
Time and again, we see that the world has evolved in so, so many ways, both global and interpersonal, and both visually and in dialogue. If you follow Paya around in Kakariko, you'll find that she's taking her responsibilities as the new village chief quite seriously. She'll comment on all the going-ons around town in passing. And at one point, I even noticed a Kako briefly trail behind her. The speech bubbles act as a nice way for the devs to offer NPCs some interiority, even when you're not directly addressing them. There are also these smaller, subtler gestures characters might make while talking. Animations like pointing at their head while talking about memory, or closing their eyes to take in a sea breeze. Doing a victory stomp when talking about an accomplishment. In the case of this Rito, Verla, the gestures he doesn't make say as much as the ones he does. He's suffering from an injured wing, so he doesn't lift his arms or gesture with them, just nurses it while talking about it, and otherwise keeps it down on his hips. Finally, we see the same thing with the Rito kids as we did with the Hylians. A lot of them have grown up, and their models have been updated as a result. Here are some time lapses again for comparison. Without spoiling anything, the Rito Village arc was my favorite in the whole game, as the fact that the kids have grown up is actually vital to the sense of growth you're supposed to feel forming around the town. There's a coming-of-age story here, not only for the NPCs, but also for the town as a place and a community. Seeing the kids grow into their new designs really ties that transformation together. That said, the majority of the adult population, outside of the important characters that is, still looks the same. There's a generic Rito male, and a generic Rito female. But that doesn't mean we don't have things to talk about. Breath of the Wild lead NPC artist, and now Tears of the Kingdom senior lead character artist, Hirohito Shinoda, writes that the Rito champion Revali was the design they nailed down first, and he was the blueprint for the rest. It's why they all take after Birds of Prey. Consequently, it's why their diets account for meat and fish. In fact, it's why the Lurelin lovebirds found their way there. Apparently, they were both craving fish. Little quirks like this still help us parse specific NPCs apart. As with Olkin and Steen, you also see two Rito rivals, Huck and Verla, working together for the good of the community now. You find both on reconnaissance missions outside the village, and can get them to come back if you do their side quests. What I love about this is that Verla, remember he had the wing injury, gets healed up upon returning to town, and is the only Rito who flies freely around the village, visiting various spots throughout the day. He's got one of the most dynamic routines in the game. He's visibly feeling better, and the game makes a point of it. Isn't that cool? The main way you can tell him, Huck, and the other Rito apart is their choice of pants. The one other detail I love is that the Rito's feathers and earrings will blow in the breeze, taking wind direction and intensity into account. In fact, this is a good segue. Next, we move on to the Zora, our resident fish elves. As with the Rito, I appreciate that the Zora's fins blow in the breeze, again with the appropriate wind direction in mind. They also have a slightly more diverse makeup than the other non-Hylian races, as there's a wide variety of recolors and body types inspired by different types of aquatic animals. The art book even fleshes out some of the differences between younger and older Zora, the children have smaller tails and their ear fins flop down, reminiscent of young cats. The elders have dark smudges and water damage on their fins, and the protective tips over their foreheads bent down from just how much swimming they've done throughout their lives. In the kitchen areas, you'll find salt and pepper shakers with blue fish-inspired designs. Check out the blacksmith's workbenches, and you'll also see a wide array of tools that go beyond just the hammers they're carrying. Speaking of machinery, the Zora love water, so if you show off one of your own hydrants, they might express a desire to get one of their own. Finally, Takehara highlights that the Zora record most of their history on stone tablets instead of paper, because books could get worn down from water damage, which is a real risk around these parts. 
This contrasts them from the books in the Rito village, where they're bound with traditional paper and even bookmarked with feathers. One of the only traditional books you see in Zora's domain is the notebook carried by their local historian, presumably for short-term note-taking, but as she digs through the old tablets, she does remark that they hold more than just historical records. They also hold fun escapist texts and romances in them, which she ultimately thinks are worth preserving as well. It's a lovely touch. We'll be here all day if I recite more side quests, but Manny's is far from the only one to repeat beats from the previous game. There's Azora, Mei, who's gone missing under similar circumstances to last time's. She's absent-minded and tends to lose track of time. Her husband is worried sick again. One of her kids is thinking about how to care for his brother if mom keeps disappearing, while his brother is as aloof and chipper as Mei is. Each is taking after a different parent, which is fun. Next up, Goron City. Like everywhere else in Hyrule, trade and commerce has hit a new high around these parts following the expansion of the Goron's mining activities. Diamonds are now sold at a discounted price, implying that they've made new breakthroughs in mining. In fact, many of the returning characters have been employed by the new Goron mining company and strapped on these new uniforms. Blue branded overalls. You can see the workforce, which comprises both Goron and Hylian labor, performing various feats of physical labor here. And some of the workers even cooling off in the water. I appreciate that the game adds some new, unique Goron designs into the mix too. There's the Goron chef and restaurant owner, amusingly named Cook. There's the food critic who sits just outside and looks like a food critic who sits just outside. The increased focus on Goron cuisine is a nice touch that builds on what we saw in the last game, like in this old side quest with the two hungry brothers, for instance. But it also complements something Takehara discussed wanting to portray. See, in a lot of the homes around the city, you're able to find these Goron shogi boards. Always mid-game. And even Goron toys. He writes that these cute recreational activities are meant to contrast the strong, gruff personas they otherwise exude. In his words, they demonstrate the Goron's slightly timid, softer side. On the outskirts of Gerudo Town, which only admits women, you can encounter a male Goron demanding entry into the town because his buddy told him he'd been allowed in. Oh. The guards don't believe him, of course. They try to turn him away. The thing is, I believe him. I believe his buddy was Linde or Strayed, a pair of Gorons from Breath of the Wild who were mistaken for being female and allowed entry into the town much to their own confusion. According to creating a champion, it wasn't uncommon for Gorons to be mistakenly admitted at the time of Breath of the Wild. Oh. Linde is in tears too, but he's no longer in Gerudo Town. Oh. You can meet him walking around the oh. overworld, where he's practicing some Gerudo greetings. Oh. Guess he picked up a few things during his stay. Inside the city, you also encounter Jules, who was only a tourist just passing by last time. She liked it there so much, though, that she's moved here permanently. I'll also point out this flirt called Bozai, who used to lurk by the town entrance in the last game. He would keep running around the perimeter in his new sand boots until you talk to him. Now, seven years later, he's straight up busted inside. You can find him lurking on one of the town's walls, still wearing those sand boots. You'll also know that the friend groups who hung out together last time still comprise the same NPCs. 
As with the Rito and Hylians, you see some of the Gerudo kids grow into these new models here too. Here, have a look. Time and again, these moments of recognition surprised me in terms of how seen they made me feel. Or rather, how much I felt I was seeing of Hyrule. My particular love for Gerudo Town doesn't stem from the callbacks to Breath of the Wild though. Rather, it's from how many unmarked quests it contains. There are some NPC throughlines here that aren't explicitly marked in your log. You can discover them yourself and prompt their storylines to progress just by playing around a little bit. I'm being vague because I found these quote-unquote puzzles to be quite satisfying and worth solving yourselves. And in one particular case, the reward made me laugh out loud. In addition, while several of the Gerudo Vi look the same, I do like the wide variety in their hairstyles, complexions, body types, ages, and patterned outfits. Which we can see an overview of in some concept art here. Although there isn't much wind in the desert, you'll notice that their earrings dangle and blow in it too, just like with the Zora and Rito. Catch them somewhere else in the world though, and you'll see that they jingle even more in stormier weather. It's a nice touch, emblematic of just how intricate the game's systems and animations are. For fixed objects, have a look around the kitchens and cooking classrooms, where you'll see a wide area of culinary tools, including cutting boards, whisks, different kinds of mixing spoons, and mortar and pestles. The incidental props in the Zora, Rito, and Goron settlements are a lot more thematically distinct. Here, the theme is simple but versatile, practical but backed. It's more reminiscent of what you see in the Hylian towns. Finally, Takehara continues to be a world-building MVP, as Gerudo Town's layout has also had a lot of thematic thought put into it. He writes that, historically, any person displaying mastery over the water in a desert environment has been recognized as a sign of authority within their desert culture. It's why the town's water all flows out from Riju's throne room, signifying her authority. It's difficult to have a holistic conversation about Gerudo Town without also raising conversations about gender. To be honest, I don't love the connotations that come with excluding the Gorons now, seven years later. They're an all-male race, or they're genderless, and simply associated with being male. The English version of Breath of the Wild framed them as having been allowed in by mistake, but according to a translation by Kaya Loan on Tumblr, the Japanese version implies the Gerudo just treat Gorons as if they could be female. This quote-unquote tightened security feels like a rare instance in which Hyrule has taken a step backwards, socially, instead of forwards. It's an odd moment, in a game that's otherwise about people coming together, looking past their differences, and learning to rebuild. Thankfully, it was one of very few vignettes I disliked. In the broader context, we actually see some nice moments of progression regarding NPC relationships and gender dynamics, especially from original to sequel. For the most part, Tears' female NPCs are as active and adventurous as their male counterparts. And the ones in partnerships are supported as well. Take Ralera who lived in Hateno with her husband in Breath of the Wild, but would often talk about missing her hometown. Now, you can convince her to move back to Lorelin, and her husband will even go with her. It's a warm display of support and reciprocation after their long years spent away. They'll even take active roles in Lorelin's development, there's this fabled place in Hyrule called Lover's Bond, a heart-shaped bond where it's said that meeting someone is a sign you're destined for one another. A couple from Breath of the Wild, the Gerudo Perda and Hylian Wabin, had their meet cute there. In Tears of the Kingdom, we learn that they're both married and still going strong. In fact, they have a daughter together, but as is custom for Gerudo, Perda has moved back to town to raise her daughter among her people. Even with how much importance they place on marriage, the Gerudo do still advocate for independence. 
they pursue their careers, with or without their husbands close by. And as for Wabin himself, he decides that being close to his family in Gerudo Town is more important to him than living a free life. So he's... <laughs> happy to try to sneak in, fail, and live in a jail cell there. It is equal parts funny, tragic, stupid, and kind of heartwarming. Finally, take the elder, Muava. She was one of the few Gerudo who saw through your disguise in Breath of the Wild, but she was cool about it. She was just happy to reminisce about her old adventure in days, and how she always wanted to find Lover's Bond, but never did. In tears, she's started adventuring again, and she's made it to Lurelin, which Lover's Bond directly overlooks. It's a lovely depiction of how age doesn't have to slow you down or signify the end of your story. As far as Tears of the Kingdom is concerned, Muava's has just begun. I don't have as much to say about the Koroks, except to state the obvious. They're adorable. One thing I did notice is that the Koroks hiding out in the open world won't be phased by you throwing stuff. But the ones who provide escort missions and the ones at home, in the Korok forest, will get spooked a little bit. My favorite was this one who holds these two cherry branches. I tossed out a bright bloom seed and saw him not just quiver, but also nervously point one of his branches out like a weapon? Question mark? They also have this cute little wobbling animation they do when walking away. I have little to say about the constructs too, but they are the first NPCs you meet in the game, and I enjoyed how they're introduced. I'm a fan of the earring-like lights on them, which resemble both typical Zonai flashlights and the bright bloom flowers you use for light. Their large eyes and relatively personable design distinguishes them from the more impersonal Shika mechs of old. In addition to Mei and Manny, I'll recap one last side quest with echoes from Breath of the Wild for my next point. You can meet a Gerudo whose Hylian husband has fallen sick. Again. And she asks you for some medicinal ingredients. Again. But she'll make a comment acknowledging the first time about how he'd gotten sick once years ago, and they'd been helped out by a kind stranger. She doesn't recognize you as that stranger, though. Here's my brain worm. I think it's interesting that only some of the returning NPCs remember you. I've seen some criticisms that allege the two games feel disconnected because there are characters who don't recognize Link. I don't really agree. I actually think having only some NPCs remember you is a great way of decentering the player. Their stories go on without you. They have full lives outside of your limited lens. More importantly, it's a good way of not isolating anyone who'd skipped the last game while jogging the memories of those who hadn't. Not everyone has to remember you, but if you remember them, there actually is connective tissue between the games, which I hope I've convinced you of by now. Mobs from Lurlin was one of the first NPCs I ever photographed for this project, so it was strangely emotional for me when I got back to Hyrule for the first time and encountered her as one of the very first people who welcomed me back. But she didn't recognize me, and that was okay. I'm less cool about Beetle of all people forgetting me. I know this game gets compared to God of War Ragnarok because it remixes existing systems and an existing map into something new, and it was released in close proximity to it, but the two games approach these remixes in a very different way. I think that's worth talking about. As a friend of mine pointed out, Ragnarok assumes Kratos did everything in 2018. He completed every side quest, defeated every Valkyrie, found every collectible. Tears of the Kingdom makes no such presumptions. It assumes Link did the major quest lines and progresses as if the things that would have impacted the world most have happened, but it doesn't draw a correlation between them. Link is close friends with the champion's descendants, of course. The villagers at Kakariko know him. He attended Hudson and Ronson's wedding, and the two are still together and well acquainted with him. At the same time, everyone who Link could have recruited to work for Hudson in Tarrytown is still in Tarrytown. 
But were you responsible for getting the town built and fully staffed? That's heavily implied, but still left purposefully open-ended. That one Gerudo you helped by the side of the road? You were strangers passing in the night, and that's okay. So far, I've told you about my personal favorite NPCs, but I've also made sure to leave a sizable number of them out so you can discover them for yourselves if you'd like. For instance, Loon, who one quest in Breath of the Wild referred to as a lover of all things ancient, is very much still that, and now chasing a different kind of historical discovery. Finley and Sasan, the strange Zora Hylian duo you could help get together but who had this bizarre situation going on with their age gap, have thankfully been retconned a little bit, and in a way I appreciated. The Gerudo archaeologist Rotana returns with one of THE coolest side quests, one that follows up on a mystery established in the previous game, with some revelations about Hyrule's past that really affected me. I leave the details behind these characters, and more, out because, truthfully, the fact that they're all named and have unique arcs from Breath of the Wild means it would be impossible to cover them all in one place. And I think it'd be fun if you discovered some for yourself. In fact, tell me about any cool finds in the comments if you want. We can pool our findings. The commitment the game makes to unique personalities is special, and very much in the spirit of the franchise. Increasingly, I feel that this series in which I focus on appreciating small details needs to be as much about appreciating the people making these games as they are about the games themselves. The following are the names credited for character art. And these as character senior lead artists. We touched on Hiraoka's work earlier in the video. He was an NPC artist on Breath of the Wild. Although the overlap between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom developers was reportedly small, I do want to point out that this intersection still includes many of the names we've quoted. The people who worked on this clearly had a deep love and familiarity with the material. And it shows. They know, at the core, what makes a typical Zelda NPC stand out. It means they know themselves and how to iterate on what came before. It means many of them know these characters from 2017 in some capacity, no matter how minor. They know the right combinations to redistribute them in around this map. They know to cross over Mimo and Branly the Birdman. <laughs> And they know that quirky personalities like this work. They encourage the player to interact in fun ways and partake in mischief. It's all just so expressive. For all these reasons and more, for its approach to sequel Ising NPCs from Breath of the Wild and developing them from there, Tears of the Kingdom has been one of the most rewarding people-watching experiences I've had in quite some time. But what about its photography? Breath of the Wild did many things good, more things great, and most things dang near perfect. Its photo mode was not one of them. I talked about this a bit in my very first NPC video, what I learned photographing NPCs for a year. Essentially, any photos you took using Link's camera would only be saved to an in-game album, with no way to export them to the Switch. The photos couldn't even be viewed in full screen, and were saved in a lower resolution than the actual game. Combined with the fact that the Switch can't save high-quality PNG screenshots unlike other home consoles, this meant that you were out of luck getting any of these photos onto a computer, at least without additional software. Back then, in the midst of much ado and loitering, I played around with Link's scope to see if it was viable as a substitute screenshotting tool for the camera. I ultimately favored the camera, but as of Tears' release, I do have some addendums. If I could suggest ways to make these games' cameras more versatile, I think there are some interesting solutions to be found in the scope. For one thing, there are some smaller, more agile critters who are much harder to capture as they scuttle around a lot. But imagine a way to combine your time manipulation abilities from either game with your photography. Imagine being able to adjust the shutter speed, or to enter bullet time if you were allowed to open the camera in midair. Because guess what? That's exactly what happens when you open your scope in midair. 
Here, you can see me watching some Rito out on patrol, mid-flight in bullet time, in a way you normally can't. You can do this for smaller birds too. And even Koroks, in a way the camera tool doesn't let you. The scope didn't used to be accessible in midair, so I appreciate that it is in Tears of the Kingdom. Secondly, you actually could use an ability in tandem with the scope in Breath of the Wild. So this wouldn't have been that strange a move. By activating Daruk's protection, you could cast the glow from your barrier onto nearby faces for additional lighting. Thankfully, Tears of the Kingdom also finally lets you full screen your camera photos. It doesn't solve everything, but it solves enough and makes virtual photography a far more viable pursuit. Mind you, these photos are regrettably low res even within the in-game album, but I loved the art style and lighting and weather effects of these games so much, I didn't really mind that. With its lengthy compendium to fill out and the soft bloom of its camera lens, complemented by a simple automated bokeh effect, Tears is still an extremely rewarding photography experience. Less for the product and more for the process. I loved people watching in this game, and I loved getting lost just... nature watching. I loved seeing the little jittering animals and the butterflies trilling about, and the amount of animation work that's been put in into making this such a breathing, bountiful ecosystem. Pictures feel less staged and more... like pictures, snapped of an indifferent world in its natural state. Considering how much else you're able to do, opting into filling out your compendium feels like a real choice. A real nature photography simulator you yourself prioritize. Thanks to the intricate physics system and the generous arsenal of tools at your disposal, you're also able to complement your shots with cool and useful effects. Whenever I found myself hurting for lighting, or felt that the light landed flat on a character's face, I'd toss out a bright bloom flower to cast some additional light around our surroundings, and thereby help illuminate the shot. If you want a softer, more natural light, you can also whip out some flint and firewood. And get some nice firelight going. Your other tools have a lot of versatility to aid your photography too. Animals scuttle away when you get too close, put on your best stealth armor, and they'll be more likely to let you near him. Having trouble centering that bear? You can just freeze it and log it to your compendium as an ice sculpture. <laughs> Want to study a Mulduga or some other giant boss up close? An NPC will convert your photos of enemies into 3D models for display. Need a higher angle shot? Just toss out a hoverstone and use it as your personal adjustable tripod. I absolutely adored photographing the NPCs of Hyrule and filling out my compendium with as much commitment to taking aesthetic shots as I could muster. It felt like a whole other game within the game. On top of that, it's been especially satisfying to track the NPCs as a fan of the predecessor. Back in that first NPC video, I mentioned that it felt futile to make a Breath of the Wild standalone, since all its NPCs had already been meticulously documented, with entire wiki pages dedicated to them. With the additions made in this latest installment, those wiki pages will and have started to grow ever longer. But this time, I think I do have something I want to say about it. I want to talk about why I think that is. Why did Zelda Dungeon record them with this much attention to detail? Why is there a Breath of the Wild NPC dialogue Tumblr dedicated to compiling every possible conversation from the previous game? Why did writer PJ Manning rank every NPC he met in an article for the Punished Backlog? In the past, I've received messages about being the first to notice certain details about NPCs that others hadn't picked up on. With these two titles, I find that that's a harder ask. And I guarantee it is because games like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom inspire exploration and note-taking and attention to detail in everyone, not just me. They spark our imaginations ablaze. They breathe by you in their quietest moments. And laugh with you when you partake in hijinks and hijinks and hijinks galore. They make you pay attention. And I'm glad I do.
What excites me above all else is that there's a narrative drive that ties this all together. Photography is a way of connecting the player to Zelda. Yeah, I'm going to revisit those pins we've been setting throughout the video. Zelda and Link are separated for most of the game, but as we saw in Breath of the Wild, she was a massive photography enthusiast. Not least of all because taking photos helped her to learn more about the world. Her camera was even part of her moveset in the spin-off, Age of Calamity. One of her very first interactions in Tears of the Kingdom sees her taking pictures of Link as you explore some ruins together. Now to use this invention of Pura's. I'm glad I didn't leave it behind. And those are not only the first photos saved in your camera roll, but also the only ones you didn't take yourself. What are photographs, if not memories frozen in time? They're images reflecting a particular moment or feeling or sense of place. They're reminders of your time with someone. And if you'll pardon the pun, a photograph is a link to the past. Breath of the Wild really bought into that idea, as Zelda's photos were the primary way through which Link regained his memories. Her pictures triggered a familiar emotional response within him, time and again, and helped restore both his sense of self and his long-standing bond with her. Although the collectible memories in Tears of the Kingdom take a different shape, I do think Zelda's love of photography continues to have a resonance throughout the game, especially as it pertains to NPCs. See, there's something I've been touching on but not fully delved into yet. Between the two games, Princess Zelda has been crucial to spearheading the development efforts that have made Hyrule what it is today. She led the construction of the school in Hateno Village. She was a regular at Kiana's restaurant, and was even the one who gave it its name, Azure Bay. She would regularly visit the fairies around Lover's Pond, and gifted the villagers of Lurulin a portrait of it she captured herself. In fact, Muava mentions that seeing that portrait was enough to fulfill her desire to see the pond someday. Zelda gave them the idea to open their salt spa too. She planted a garden of dozens of different kinds of flowers with Magda, a frankly terrifying NPC, in an effort to preserve them. She left flowers at various monuments to the fallen that you can stumble across. She was the people's princess, and they loved her. And she them. If you visit Zelda's house at Hateno Village, you'll find more of those kids' drawings hung up in her secret study. More saliently, you'll find framed photographs of many of these NPCs and quest givers, who she took the time to take pictures of while working with them. Even though she's missing, it's strangely moving. Her presence is felt all across Hyrule, and even here, through the camera lens we know she stands on the other side of. She's a photographer out of sight, but never out of mind. All the people you can talk to prove that. You have a lot of options with how you choose to approach Tears of the Kingdom, what roles you choose to prioritize when off the beaten path, and as it stands, I think Photographer is the one that mirrors Zelda's perspective most, shows Link the closest approximation of how Hyrule looks through her eyes. Through someone else's eyes. It shows us its land and people in a different light. Let's revisit that question. What is a photo, if not a moment frozen in time? Well, it's a way of seeing the world. Hello! A huge thank you to my partner for her hand in this video. She was catching up on Breath of the Wild at the same time I was playing Tears, so she was my own link to the past, if you will. Seeing these two versions of Hyrule side by side was instrumental to me noticing the arcs I did for these characters, and she made sure to capture highlights from her own playthrough and talk me through them to help that along. Thanks, you. And now, the usual outro. Hey! Thanks so much for watching that. This video is actually part of a series in which I look at NPCs and even more games that pique my interest. I also make video essays about games, movies, and all that good stuff. So if you like my work, consider subscribing. I've linked my Ko-Fi below too. It's an optional tip jar if you want to throw a sandwich or coffee my way or something. Last but not least, I've included links to the social media pages where I post my photos, down below in the description. Juxtaposed with my photos, you might find some short stories I've come up with about the various NPCs I've looked at. So, enjoy?
Thank you again for sticking around, and until next time, remember that every stranger on the streets got a story, and every story can only get stranger.